Amen. Thank you, Brother Zach. Can you hear me back there? Wonderful. All right, our timer's over. Welcome, families of faith. Thank you for joining us today here at Midweek Connections Church Service. You know, over the last month or so, we've briefly um, looked at the church of Ephesus and the Ephesians that were living there. The church of Ephesus is really an awesome testimony of God when you get to look at it. I don't know if anybody here has ever actually read through the book uh, through Ephesians that the, is the letter that Paul wrote to the church of Ephesus. But when you do, you find a lot of awesome um, examples and instructions on how we are supposed to live out our lives. What's interesting I find about Ephesus, though, is Paul wrote this letter to the Ephesians. And roughly just 30 years later, we find Jesus wrote his own letter to the church of Ephesus. It, only 30 years later, something happened to where Jesus had to address him themselves personally. And we're going to look at that today. But Ephesus is really a neat place when you look at it. The word Ephesus itself means desirable. It was a place that was very desirable for people to come. Not necessarily the church at the time, but the town itself. Ephesus foundation found in Acts 18 is really neat also. It tells us that a Jew named Apollos came to Ephesus. The Bible tells us that he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew of the baptism of John. That's how the church started. Apollos came along talking and teaching people about God and the truths of Jesus, but he didn't know that Jesus had come. Perhaps you remember in Acts 19, when Paul arrived in Ephesus, the Bible tells us that he found some disciples and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And if you remember their response, they answered, no, we have not even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. Well, we know from the testimony of what's in the Bible that Paul told them about the Messiah. They, he told them that Jesus did come that Jesus did offer himself as a ransom for our sins, and that God did raise Jesus from the dead, just like their Old Testament preaching and beliefs told them would happen. And then we find that they believed what Paul was telling them about Jesus, the crucifixion, and the resurrection, and that they received the Holy Spirit. We find out that Paul spent about three years in Ephesus, preaching the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at the church of Ephesus, like I said, it's really an amazing church with an awesome testimony from the beginning of Acts to the end book, Revelation. The church of Ephesus is so important that it's one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation that Jesus, like I said, wrote a letter to. And God tells us that he had this done so he could make it known to us. Now, if you've ever looked at the seven churches in the book of Ephesus, or I'm sorry, in the book of Revelation, Ephesus, to me, sounds like the better of the seven churches when you read about what they were going through and what Jesus addressed them on. In Revelation chapter 2, verses 2 through 3, the angel of God comes with a message from Jesus to tell the Ephesians, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. I know that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and you have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now let's just stop there for a moment. And I want to ask you guys a question. In this day and age that we're living in, does that sound like any church that you know of? Do the Ephesians, with their good deeds, 
their hard work and their perseverance remind you of anyone that you know? Does it? Yes or no? Amen. I hope it does because really when I look at that, I look at you guys, families of faith. That's what I think of when I think of the Ephesians and the church in Ephesus. I think of all of you, you families of faith. Whether you've been here since the beginning and you used to meet over on Friar Street many decades ago, or if this is your first time ever here with us, worshiping with us, you remind me of the Ephesians found here in the book of Revelation. In the midst of all your pain, all your fear, and all your uncertainties of what's going on in life, you're here today in the Lord's house. And I'm pretty sure you're here because you know that God is the only sta stable certainty that we have in this world. Amen? Amen. And it's all that we need in this world also. And truthfully, because of your midweek connections, your good deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance throughout the years and even the decades, we get to be part of the blessing of what God has done in your lives. We get to hear the testimonies of what God's brought you through. And you, Midweek Connections, have the ability to encourage the younger generations. Pastor John's youth group, we all know they're on fire, don't we? Yes? No? Amen? If you've been around in the church, you know Pastor John and the youth, they're on fire. Now, did you know that the youth, the youth, those young kids, have ideas and plans that they want to partner with you, the senior ministry, and come along and do things together for the Lord. Pastor John's got a whole group of them ready and reared up. But the problem is it takes two. We got the youth. We need the seniors. Now, it's not necessarily about work that's physical work. Sometimes it's just your testimonies that they need to hear to encourage them in their walk with the Lord. But like I said earlier, Ephesus was a desirable place. It was a desirable place full of beauty. It actually holds one of the seven wonders of the ancient world that to this day, people still go take trips in person to see. But likewise, here in Shanahan, God is making families of faith the modern-day church of Ephesus. Is that not true? People are driving well over an hour and a half from all directions around Shanahan to come see and be part of what God is doing here at Families of Faith. That's amazing. Because in this time of confusion, pain, hatred, and uncertainty in all our lives, the people that I'm meeting that are coming from all over different directions, they're telling me that they're coming this great distance because they've heard what God is doing out here in Shanahan and that they want to be part of what God is doing. That's why I say thank God that out of all the churches in the book of Revelation, we resemble the church of Ephesus. But just because we do, just because we resemble that good church with hard work, perseverance, and all the things that we have here, does not mean that we are anywhere exempt from the reason that Jesus had to adjust the church of Ephesus. Like I said earlier, it was just 30 years later when Jesus wrote his letter to the Ephesians that we heard in Revelation 2. We know, Jesus says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know you can't tolerate wicked people. I know that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not. I know you've persevered and endured hardships for my name, and I know you've, grown, you've not grown weary. But look at what Jesus says to the church of Ephesus following in verse 4. He says, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. As Paul's letter to the Ephesians is full of instructions on how they ought to live, I would have to stop and think that they probably didn't adhere to Paul's instructions. I mean, if they did, I don't think Jesus would have to address them just 30 years later, telling them, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you have at first. 
when I stop and think of where the Ephesians were, I think what an awful, scary place that is to be. They have forsaken their first love, God himself. Now we, Midweek Connections, we're here. Amen. We have good deeds. We have hard work. We definitely persevere. But we must do the things that we do for the Lord out of our love for him, not out of obligation to him. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen the difference between a grumpy employee and a happy one. But when we're doing things out of love for the Lord, we're like one of those happy employees. But if we start doing things just out of obligation, we wind up looking like one of those grumpy employees when we start to lose our first love. Now, I don't know if any of you either have grandkids, but my grandfather, when I was young, used to ask for help all the time. Sometimes I'd like to help, and sometimes I wouldn't want to. Sometimes my grandmother would make me go downstairs in the basement and help him, and I would get down there knowing he wanted help, and he would look at me and say, what are you doing? Get back upstairs. Well, you just wanted my help. No, he wanted my help, not my bad attitude. And that was a life lesson that I had to learn. But it's pretty applicable to how it is when we're serving the Lord. He wants us to serve him with the love that we have for him, not with the obligation that we owe him. So my prayer for us this week is that we don't wind up like the Ephesians, forsaking our first love. Because like I said, we do resemble the church of Ephesus, and that's a wonderful thing. But you've seen what happened to them. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be going through Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus to see what Paul's seen in them and to see what we don't see in ourselves. That way, we may not end up like the Ephesians, forsaking their first love. So if you consider yourself a servant of God, then listen up as we explore the letter that Paul wrote, which is found in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, God starts off telling us who Paul is and who Paul is speaking to. And this is very important. Often we kind of just go right past the first couple sentence or the first couple verses because it's to us it really doesn't make too much sense or yeah we know Paul's an apostle we know he's here by the will of God but what does it say Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Eph Ephesus the faithful in Christ Jesus Paul he's an apostle we hear that word all the time, but do we even know what apostle means? The word apostle means one who is sent by. So Paul is an apostle. He's one that is sent by God himself in Christ Jesus to do the will of God. And the will of God in that moment, in that moment of Paul's life was to write this letter to the Ephesians. And Paul wrote it, and God today wants us to hear it. Now remember, Paul was sent by God to do God's will. This isn't Paul's will or Paul's opinion. Because if you remember Paul, when he was Saul, his will was to persecute Christians, not to lead people to Jesus. So we know this isn't Paul's will to begin with. This is God's will. Likewise, I want to share something with you guys. This is not just some story in the Bible that I thought would be great sharing with you. This is not some knowledge that I know of. Everything that I've preached so far has been the, what God wanted to, is what God wanted you to hear. Through prayer and obedience, I could tell you that this message is what God wants to, you to hear today. And because I could tell you that, remember... Don't simply be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. After all, just like Paul was addressing the Ephesians, you, Midweek Connections, are also God's holy people, and you are the faithful in Christ Jesus. Amen? 
Amen, I know you're the faithful. You're here week after week after week after year after decades for some of you. You haven't given up on God, and I praise him for that. You're the faithful in Christ Jesus. You're God's holy people. And in verse 2, Paul goes on to tell us, grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord of Jesus Christ. God tells us, God's telling you, Grace and peace to you. Think about that. Grace and peace in our lives is only obtained through the finished works of Christ on the cross. There's no grace and peace in our lives without salvation, is there? No, there's not. God is telling us that if we are faithful in the gospel message of Christ in our lives, then we have that grace and peace that is only obtainable when we ask God to forgive us of our sins. In verse 3, we, see, we find Paul saying, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Have you ever really stopped and thought about what he's saying there? Spiritual blessings. What's a spiritual blessing? What does that even mean? God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Now, stop and think about where Paul was when he was writing this letter. He was in prison in Rome. He was in prison when he's writing about God blessing us with, in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. While he was in prison, Paul also wrote a, a letter to the church of Philippians. And in that one, Paul tells them, What has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains... Most of my brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. This is a spiritual blessing for Paul. He didn't let confusion, pain, hatred, or uncertainty dictate his situation. Paul knew that God was allowing this to happen to him, and he praised God for it, because as Paul said, God is allowing this to happen to advance the gospel. When we think of blessings, we immediately think of physical things or people in our lives, which, yes, is a form of a blessing from God. But here, we're talking about spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. These are things that moths can't destroy and thieves cannot steal. Think about it. Heavenly places is where our mansion waits for us. Our spiritual blessings are the fact that God chose to save us. God chooses to use us for his purpose. Spiritual blessings are always with us. And God tells us what they are all throughout, his, all throughout the Bible. He tells us things like if God is for us, who can be against us? That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and are called to his purpose. That we, we lack nothing because we could do it all things through Christ who strengthens us. Those are spiritual blessings that God has lavished on us. We were once blind and mute, but now God has given us the ears to hear and the eyes to see. He's given us his wisdom, his peace, his patience. He asks us to be a beacon of light in this lost world. Why? So that we can advance the gospel of Christ. God has equipped you with everything you need to accomplish the works that he has planned in advance for you to do. These are spiritual blessings. You, Midweek Connections, are already completely equipped to do the things God is calling you to do. And many of you are. Praise the Lord for that. Every day I hear how somebody else is starting something new 
or doing a new ministry or a new Bible study or anything. It's wonderful to hear because we don't dictate what God's work is for you. God dictates that. And when you start partnering with him, it is a blessing for us to hear because we know what God could do through it. Just remember, as we serve the Lord, let's do it out of our love for him, not our obligation to him. Verses 4 through 6 tell us, For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Now these are two verses we really need to look at because if we look at them from the wrong perspective, we could be looking at ourselves more than we ought to. And it could also hurt others thinking that they are exempt from receiving God's gift of salvation. Because after all, we know that God wishes no man to perish, but all come to repentance. And we know that anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen? Amen. It's not that God predestined me, you, 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 and not these people over here. Did God choose us? Yes, he did. Because from the beginning, before the beginning, God knew that we, mankind, were going to fall short of his glory. He knew we were going to choose sin over him. So what did God do instead? He chose us because we weren't going to choose him. He knew that he was going to have to send Jesus to rescue us from ourselves. And all this was, and this was all done by God. It's his works that made this happen, not ours. And it's the gift of salvation that God gives to us freely if we ask him for it. Are we special to God? Yes, we are, but only because Jesus died for us. Paul goes on to lay out the gospel message and remind us in verse 7 and 8 that in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Through the shedding of Jesus' blood, God lavished on us. He covered us. He gave us an overabundance of his grace and his mercy. God opened our eyes and our ears to things we could not possibly perceive without him. Jesus paid our sin penalty, and we received the rewards and his righteousness. And on this earth, we do get to experience some of the benefits of being in Christ. Obviously, our salvation is one of them. His love and His peace for us. The deposit of the Holy Spirit, which leads us to all truth. We are redeemed. That's the evidence of it. But let's not forget that it came at a cost. There is a payment and a penalty for our sins. And Jesus paid it all, right? Well, as the song goes, all to him we owe. Amen? Amen. In verses 9 through 10, Paul tells us that God made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the time reaches their fulfillment, to bring unity in all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now you think about that, the mystery of God's will and his purpose. We didn't even know. Think about it. Before you were saved, before God rescued you, did you even know that you were dead in your sins and destined for hell? I didn't. I had no idea what that even meant. But despite that, before that, Just at the right time, while we were still powerless, 
Christ died for the ungodly. God had the rescue plan in place before he even laid out the foundations of the earth. God had the rescue plan in place. Verses 11 through 12 tell us, In him, in Christ, we were also chosen, having having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put on our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. Here we see it again. We're only 12 verses in, and we see it again. In Christ, right? Because that's what we're in. We're in Christ. Outside of Christ, we are nothing. Outside of Christ, we can't do anything. Outside of Christ, Paul wouldn't even be writing these letters. Paul would be writing up a letter saying, go capture those people. Let's torment them and kill them. But in Christ, he became a new creation. Because of Christ, God adopts us into sonship. He calls us ambassadors And he has works that are planned for us in advance. What is the works that God wants us to do? It's simple. We heard it last week. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what God wants us to do. Let the light that's in us shine. Now the next part of this found in verses 13 and 14 are really exciting. I like hearing this a lot. God tells us, and you, that's us, were also included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked with him a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of His glory. Do you guys get out of that what I got out of that? You're marked by God with His seal of approval. Now, I like to think of that seal as one of those big, shiny, shiny gold stickers that you see on a product that usually is on a top-shelf product that has all the bells and whistles, guaranteed number one, rated number one, best of all. You always see those big, gold, shiny stickers. I like to think of God's seal like that, but the truth is it's not like that at all. God's seal's better than that. God says we're better than that. God says that you are His, His workmanship, Now, you often you hear that word workmanship and just think, oh, yeah, it's something he did. We do a lot of workmanship around the house, and a lot of times it falls apart because it wasn't done the right way, right? Men, we get that, don't we? Well, that's not workmanship. If anything, that's spotty workmanship. But workmanship is giving it your all, giving it your best, making the best product that you could possibly make. That's who we are. God says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus with his big old seal of approval saying that, yes, you are unique. Yes, you are different, but you are absolutely perfect for the works that he has planned in advance for you to do. So when you hear and you see that seal in your life, instead of saying it's the best, to me when I see it, it says, now go, Advance my gospel message. That's what God has for us. He's enriched, he's lavished us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We're not going to be able to fully wrap our minds around that. It's literally incomprehensible for us to fully comprehend, and we know that because God's ways aren't our ways and his thoughts aren't our thoughts. But what I do see out of that the little glimpse of what God shows me about these spiritual blessings in heavenly realms is that when Paul was writing this message, he was sitting in prison. 
He was in chains for Christ. He didn't let his situation dictate how he was going to act. We've heard before that Paul was in chains for Christ, right? What happened? The walls broke. He could have took off running, but instead he sat around singing praises. And what had happened? The jailer and his entire household came to know who Jesus was that night. Paul says that he's in chains for Christ, and he's, God's allowing this to happen so he could advance the kingdom of God. We live in these tents, these earthly tents that God has given us. He knows what bodies we have. He knows our ailments and our pains and our sicknesses. He knows the things that make us upset and angry. He knows every little thing about us. He knows us more intimately than we know ourselves. And he says, you are perfect. You are the workmanship that I created in Christ Jesus to do my will. So, as we close Midweek Connections, just, that, just as you heard that you are God's perfect workmanship, you've all agreed before that if you have breath in your lungs, you have purpose on this earth. Amen? Amen. Now, I know God's got plans for us. I know some of you are fulfilling God's plans in your lives, and that's an amen. But I know God's got more plans for us. Because if he didn't, he wouldn't have us here today. When I think of Pastor John and the youth, these are all young children getting reared up to serve the Lord. We had our testimony night, what was that, on a Wednesday. Duke was here. That was several months ago. And this whole half of the auditorium, the sanctuary, was filled with youth. And this half was filled with seniors. And Pastor Joe was asking people to give praises about what God is doing in their lives. And the youth were so on fire that they couldn't get the microphone away from them. We seniors didn't even have a chance to get that microphone because the youth just wanted to keep talking about what God is doing in their lives. And that's a wonderful thing. But you heard as Paul was sitting in chains to advance the gospel, what happened? Some of his brothers and sisters heard about what he was going through. And that encouraged them to be more bold for the Lord. Listen, our bodies, I'm a, I'm a few decades younger than you, but you, most of you know I'm a disabled veteran and my body is riddled with pain all the time. So I get pain and I get hard work. They don't work so well together, do they? No, they don't. But I think that's why God's got an easy job for you guys to do. It's a job that half of it's already waiting for. It's the youth. It's Pastor John's youth who want to partner with you. You have the opportunity to share with them the knowledge, the wisdom, the testimonies of what God's brought you through in the last several decades of your life. And these are all things that they're going to have to hear because they're going to be going through the same things that you went through, if not worse, because we know as the world goes on and on, the Bible says we create new ways to, to, we create new ways to do evil, don't we? This world is just getting worse and worse. But you have the opportunity to partner with them and encourage them and lead them and guide them and direct them. So if you have any love for the youth in this church, when we're out there having our coffee and our snacks and Pastor John walks by, we're going to stop and talk to him for a minute just to see what he's got for us. But Midweek Connections... As you continue serving the Lord, just remember to do it out of your love for Him. Because I know we all love Him. But it's very easy sometimes to get caught up in the midst of life and our love becomes an obligation. It's not necessarily bad. We're not doing it because we're wrong or we're evil. We just simply got caught up in the midst of life and love turned to an obligation. Obviously, there was something wrong with that in their lives because Jesus came 30 years later to address the situation of them forsaking their first love. So as we close, this is our time of invitation. This is a time where you get to come to God with whatever He's laying on your heart right now. Perhaps you realize that in the midst of serving the Lord, that your love is has turned to obligation. Don't worry. God knows that's going to happen. He knows everything about us. 
That's what's so neat about God is people get so hung up sometimes about, oh, no, I made a mistake. Who cares if you made a mistake? God knows you're going to make a mistake. Get back up on your feet and do what you used to do. That's exactly what Jesus tells us in Revelations 2, chapter, or chapter 2, verse 5. This is the conclusion of the letter of what he said to Ephesus. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Consider how far you've fallen. I'm not saying any of you have fallen at all, but Jesus is telling us to consider how far we have fallen. Do you remember the first day you got saved? For some of you, it might have been a very long time ago. If we had our seniors from Heritage Woods here, Jim just got saved last year, amen? Amen. Everybody knows Brother Jim, and he just got saved last year. But I remember when I first got saved, I felt like a bulldozer. There was nothing that could stop me. Time, money, family, nothing in this world was going to prevent me from doing the things that God wanted me to do. But as time went on, and the burdens and the weight of this world kind of pile on you, you kind of start losing focus, don't you? Kind of what happened to Peter when he was walking on water. He had his focus. He had his eyes fixed on Jesus. But then he started paying attention to the worldly things. Oh, my word, I'm actually walking on water. There's a storm around me. This is humanly impossible. And he began to sink, right? It happens to us. And our love for God turns to obligation sometimes. But God tells us, repent and do the things you did at first. So if you've ever felt like your love for the Lord has grown cold, if you've ever felt like the things that you're doing for him feel more like an obligation than it does love, this is your time to repent. Come to him. Leave, with, leave whatever it is that you brought with that made you feel this way. Leave it with him and go do the things you did at first. So as we close, this is your time, Midweek Connections. This is your invitation. Don't wait until it's too late. Remember, all God wants from us is one thing, our love. Let us close in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, for everything is not even enough because what you've done for us before we even knew we were sinners, you had a plan of salvation. Before you even created this world and, we know, and you knew that we would choose sin over you, you had a plan of salvation. Father, I thank you, Lord, for wanting to rescue us, for choosing to rescue us. I thank you for adopting us into your sonship. I thank you for calling us your ambassadors and having works planned in advance for us to do. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to come into your home week after week, day after day, and to hear what you have for us. Father, I just ask that you continue to guide us, continue to, to direct us, continue to teach us what is right and what is wrong, and continue to give us the opportunity to be a light into this world. Father, as we go from your home and out into this world, Guide our steps, Lord. Direct us and lead us into the conversations you want us to have so that we can have the opportunity to be a light into this world and we could glorify you, Father, for all the things that not only you have done for us who are saved, but all the things that you've done for mankind. God, we thank you for being called your children. We thank you for the Church of Families of Faith. We thank you for those who are driving hours and hours of, from their homes to be part of what you are doing here, Lord. Father, we just ask that you just continue to move through your home here and guide us to where you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.